The special blood of Yarnum's healing church was a miracle cure. A tonic for every ailment, every injury, every depression. But what lies within the sweet crimson nectar? What follows is my investigation into the disease known as the Scourge of the Beast. As with any pathogen, we should begin our investigation at the point of infection. The game's title implies that the scourge is primarily bloodborne, which means it infects the host via the transmission of blood. We learn from the blood vial description that it's no surprise that most Yarnamites are heavy users of blood. In truth, the healing church administers the blood primarily as a research tool. To the citizens of Yarnam, the old blood is a miracle cure but to those in the know, it's actually a means of accelerated evolution. The true aim of the church is to achieve greatness. As we're told by the Great One's wisdom, at Bergenworth, Master Willem had an epiphany. We are thinking on the basis of planes. What we need are more eyes. We also learn from the Metamorphosis rune that for the church, the discovery of blood made their dream of evolution a reality. Metamorphosis and the excesses and deviation that followed were only the beginning. So we understand why the blood is being administered to Yarnum's population. It's a giant experiment. Now let's move on, or rather back, to the early days of the church. In the Hunter's Nightmare research hall, it becomes clear that the church once believed that evolution could be achieved by ingesting large amounts of seawater. Amongst the deranged patients, we find a substance known as brain fluid, the description of which reads, in the early days of the healing church, the Great Ones were linked to the ocean, and so the cerebral patients would imbibe water and listen to the howl of the sea. Brain fluid arrived inside the head, the initial makings of internal eyes. So evolution comes by blood and by water, and it is the blood and the water that carry the scourge. Have you found this? It's progressing. I can see things. So the research hall patients have developed amoeba-like fluid in their heads that become the initial makings of internal eyes. Let's consider amoeba for a moment. They're basically cell organisms with the ability to alter their shape. They can live in almost any environment, including liquids like the water and blood, and most importantly, they can infect other organisms pathogenically, as in the case of the patients we find. So the first stage of the scourge's evolution is that of a simple-celled organism. Now after meeting Voltaire and joining the League, every hunter we slay will drop vermin. The description of vermin describes it as a centipede-like creature discovered on a successful hunt by League hunters. Vermin, hidden within filth, are only seen by League confederates and are the root of man's impurity. Here filth is a metaphor for human blood tainted by large quantities of old blood. But how did the centipedes find their way inside hunters? It's simple. They're the next stage of the scourge's evolution after amoebas. The more corrupt or filthy blood is, the higher chance it will contain vermin, and hunters, who ingest large quantities of old blood in order to heal, have filthier blood than most. When we reach the Nightmare of Mensis, we come across the Silver Beast enemy. If you kill Silver Beast without using a fire weapon, then an enemy known as the Hateful Maggots will jump out from the corpse and start attacking the player. Of course, Silver Beasts were once humans who ingested the old blood and transformed during a Red Moon event. If we look closely at the maggots, they're not too dissimilar from the centipedes we find in filth, although the difference is that we find the centipedes only in hunters 
and the maggots only in beasts. Finally, at the end of the hunter's nightmare, we fight the orphan of Koz, and after beating it, we're rewarded with the Koz parasite weapon, which tells us, When the carcass of Koz washed up on the coast, its insides were teeming with parasites, unlike any found in humans. The final stage of the scourge are the Koz parasites, which are only found in great ones. So first come the amoeba, which develop into vermin, then the hateful maggots, and finally the Koz parasites appear. Don't you see how they writhe, writhe inside my head? It's rather rapturous. I... We've already established that the root of the scourge is an amoeba-like bacteria transmitted via liquids. Interestingly, a strain of amoeba called a canthamoeba causes a condition known as keratitis, where the eye's cornea becomes inflamed. Comparing this to the eye of a blood drunk hunter, the eye of a hunter that's ingested large amounts of old blood, we see a similar effect. Acanthamoeba can also cause encephalitis, a condition where the bacteria inflame the brain, causing, amongst other things, fever, seizures and hallucinations. Which is interesting because mental instability is referenced many times throughout Bloodborne and it's implied that the residents are going mad. The scourge can literally cause victims to lose their minds. It's universally agreed that the Red Moon event is central to Bloodborne's story and has two major effects on the inhabitants of Yharnam. The first and most common is turning people into lycanthropic creatures that attack on sight, and is where the name Scourge of the Beast comes from. The second and far more rare effect is pregnancy, as in the case of Ariana who eventually births a baby great one. But why is the result lycanthropy for many and pregnancy for a few? Obviously only women can birth children, and the difference between Ariana and other Yana women is likely the precise strain and concentration of the scourge in her blood. But while only women can become pregnant, the truth is that during the Red Moon, a sort of reproduction takes place in all Yharnam inhabitants, men and women. The Red Moon induces pregnancy in those with the right concentrations of the scourge, but in those without, it breeds the hateful maggots and transforms them into beasts. That's why we only see hateful maggots in the beast enemies. Of course maggots don't appear in every beast we slay, but that's because the maggots are still too young and small to be noticed. Most importantly, once a human becomes a beast, it represents an evolutionary dead end for both the host and the scourge. There's simply nowhere else to go. Let the pungence of Kos cling like a mother's devotion. Bloodborne is a game about a race of beings that can't have children and it begins with a failed pregnancy, a pregnancy that which results in the death of the mother and eventually the infant too. White blood cells protect the body against both infectious disease and foreign DNA like viruses. When a woman is pregnant she effectively has a foreign object growing inside her body and her immune system doesn't know the difference between a baby and a virus. So the mother's white blood cells would, if able, eradicate the fetus as if it were a dangerous pathogen. To prevent this, the mother's immune system is effectively turned off around the placenta, protecting the baby. The failed pregnancy I spoke of earlier is that of Koz and her unnamed child, who we know as the orphan. When we find the orphan, it's crawling out of its mother's womb, which tells us that Koz died before giving birth. So Koz died during pregnancy, not labour, and her body was filled with strange eldritch parasites. One of the most common causes of maternal death during pregnancy are infections such as tuberculosis, malaria and typhus because of the effect pregnancy has on their immune system. And therein lies the answer of why Koz died. There's something vital missing in the genetics of great ones, making them susceptible to pathogens that wouldn't kill human mothers and so the parasites that infested Koz's body eventually induced the infection that killed her. Ariana's pregnancy was no miraculous virgin birth. The father of her child was Odin, who impregnated Ariana during the Red Moon event because, quite frankly, that's what Odin does. 
and in order to reproduce Auden require two things, the red moon and sufficient concentrations of the scourge. Think of the scourge as eggs impregnated by Odin sperm. But Odin sperm is actually electromagnetic radiation at wavelengths of 400 to 700 nanometers, also known as light, specifically the light of the red moon. A good metaphor for this process would be photosynthesis, but instead of converting light into energy, Odin's light induces reproduction in scourge invested beings. Both Ariana and Koz were perfect vessels for Odin's children, the only difference being that Ariana is human and Koz is a great one. Our eyes are yet to open. We now have a complete picture of the Scourge's evolutionary path. Humans can track the Scourge by ingesting microscopic amoeba from tainted blood and water. Over time, vermin develop from Scourge-tainted blood. During the Red Moon event, all men, and those women, without sufficiently tainted blood will devolve into maggot-carrying beasts. And for them, the evolutionary process ends here. Those women with sufficiently tainted blood are impregnated with Odin's child. Once the child is birthed, its umbilical cord can be ingested to evolve into a true great one, while the scourge evolves into higher form of parasites. However, this also represents an end to evolution, because, as we've seen, great ones can't carry their children to term. Every great one loses its child and yearns for a surrogate. These are the words of the umbilical cord, and they are very true. Ariana's humanity enabled her to carry her child to term, while Cos's greatness condemned her. And this is both the answer and the trap that lies at the heart of Bloodborne's mystery. Bergenworth, the Healing Church, Mensis, all search for answers to the riddle of evolution. But the answer is simple, the third umbilical cords of the Great One's children provide the means to achieve greatness. But while greatness allows us to operate on transcendental planes of thought, it also signifies the end of our genetic line, for as we know, every Great One loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate. <laughs>